I am joined by a man that needs no introduction at all, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Dwayne, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Megan. It's good to see you, and uh, thank you for that introduction. The man that needs no introduction anywhere in this civilized world, uncivilized as well. What a wonderful way to introduce me for my ego. Thank you. You're welcome. I thought I would start us off on the right foot here. <laughs> so we know that you're excited about this main event between Kamaru Usman and Jorge Masvidal. You actually got to spend some time with Jorge in the lead up to that fight with Nate Diaz. I mean, what were your impressions of him? You know, Jorge's my boy. I got a lot of love and respect for Jorge. I liked him a lot, I like his team a lot, but I also thought that, you know, going into that fight, the BMF uh, title fight was, that it was, there was unique circumstances surrounding that. Obviously it was a belt that was created um, by the company and they put this fight together between these two BMFs and Nate Diaz, of course, and Jorge Masvidal. So I thought, you know, I thought that he handled the promotion of that fight brilliantly. I thought he went out and fought a tremendous fight and, you know, the telltale sign, you know, whenever I have an opportunity to spend time with a fighter is, is always, it, it's one thing, the energy is different pre-fight than it is post-fight, whether they win or lose. And it's in that post-fight that I could really get a good sense of somebody's DNA and their wiring and their makeup. So uh, I, I really enjoyed my time with them. Jorge and I have, we, we have ties going back to Miami. I've been in Miami, South Florida since I was 18 years old, played for the University of Miami, best school in the country. That's besides <laughs> the point. Uh, also, so, you know, there's been, the legend of Jorge Masvidal is was very real down in Miami, uh, started in streets and street fighting, but then also continued to hone his skills. So yes, he's been around for a very long time. He's done a lot of these rodeos, but I think something really interesting happened. and. The fans felt this too as well. The company felt this too. And I think everybody around Jorge felt this. It's like when somebody makes a distinct decision, the world views me in one way. I want them to view me and interpret it now in a different way. And there's a few things that have to happen. So mentally he changed. Uh, so when his mentality changed, um, his energetic shift changed, and then physically, it all changed, and it all just came together. And I think timing of it, too, because timing is everything, especially, as you know, when it comes to things like this, especially in sports. Um, timing came together great. I think the world was ready for uh, this new iteration of Jorge Masvidal and, um, you know, this awakening, if you will. And then, and then the bottom line is the guy went out and proved it. Yeah, absolutely. He calls it the resurrection. And I, and I think it's perfectly said what you, you just mentioned about timing is really everything. I mean, even for this fight, timing is everything. Um, and this is taking place on Fight Island, something that a few months ago, we all would have been scratching our heads like, oh, okay, what are we talking about? So for you as, as a UFC fan, the first time you heard Dana White say, okay, we're going to have Fight Island. I mean, what went through your mind? I, I Well, first thing went through my mind, I text Dana and I said, this is effing brilliant. I <laughs> love this idea because, you know, when you back up a little bit and something that obviously we've all been trying to manage and mitigate is, you know, dealing with this pandemic and the ebbs and flows of it. it seems like we, we get it under control then it comes back and it kicks us in the gut. There's just so much happening now globally, but now we'll take it back to the beginning of the year in that first quarter where we were all locked down and um, everything got put on hold. So I think, you know, I think the company and Dana, they pivoted brilliantly. And this idea of Fight Island, I think it's interesting. It's fun for the fans. And, um, and this idea that fighters are going to fly to Island at first. And they're going to get in a cage. And they're going to do what they were born to do, which is fight. I, I love the idea. And I told Dana, because he, 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 uh, he sent me a nice gift, which was a, the uh, BMF title. And I said, look, you know, if I didn't like my jaw where I, where I have it right now, I would, I would go defend it myself and fight out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I mean, we, we maybe could have had to call you because at one point this main event fell apart. Um, you know, Gilbert Burns was out and it seemed like Kamara Usman was off the card. And then the UFC was able to, to make this happen. They brought in Jorge Masvidal. It got done at the, you know, 11th hour. They, they took flights over to um, Yaz Island, UFC Fight Island. And, you know, what for you does it say about the UFC that not only they were able to make this main event happen, but also for the fighters? I mean, Camaro and Jorge were like, 
yeah, let's do it. I'm going to fly around the world and do this on, you know, just a couple of days notice. The fight game in the UFC, there's some connective tissue to the world of professional wrestling. And one of those connective tissues is the show must always go on. And the number one thing you always want to take care of are the people who fill the seats, are the people who pay their hard-earned money. And in this case, it's, it's the fans who want to buy and watch this pay-per-view and put on a good show. And the fighters want to put on a good show. So in the spirit of the show must always go on, um, you know, for the UFC to create this, obviously this fight island, uh, which has a tremendous amount of intrigue and fun and entertainment, but then also the B side to this, and quite frankly, the most important side is what are the fighters willing to do? And are the fighters willing to fly around the world, a place that they've never been before? I mean, these are all elements that from a coaching standpoint, um, you know, th this goes against um, you know, every fiber of a coach. Wait, I don't want to fly my fighter halfway around the world. We've never been there. We don't know what the environment's like. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. We're concerned about our families. There's so much pressure and angst and anxiety and noise that happens. So the B side to this, and again, the most important side is what the fighters are willing to do. So for these guys, for Usman and for Masvidal and everybody on the card, by the way, and I felt bad for Burns, uh, you know, getting racked with this. And I know he did too, but he's going to be back because he is who he is, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, for the fighters to be willing to do what they do, to do what they're doing now, is a, is, is a real testament to, uh, to these guys um, and the women too as well. So I take my hat off to them. And also, you know, there's, there's something, and this, this is one of the great things about the fighters. Now, whether this is in the forefront of their mind, or it's somewhere in the recesses of the brain because I got a lot of other stuff to worry about, like the fight itself. It's the kind of stuff, when you do things like this, when Usman says, okay, the, the opponent who I've been fighting for, or training for, for weeks, just dropped out. I feel bad about that. He had every right to say, I'm not going to do it. But instead he goes, I'm going to do it. I'm a champion. I'm a fighting champion. I'm going to defend this title. And then for Masvidal to say, I wasn't preparing for a fight, and I'm going to do it too. I'm going to fly around the world. I'm going to do this for my family. I'm going to do this for the fans. It's the kind of thing that just gains you that special equity with fans. Yeah. And it's, it's the kind of stuff that they just don't forget. And as a huge fan, um, I, I don't forget these things. You know, when fighters, when fighters step up this way, and like, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Gonna... And you, you mentioned Kamaru. I mean, this is a guy who is 11 and 0 in the UFC. He is the welterweight champion. I mean, he, he has a lot on the line here. Um, when you watch him fight, I mean, what impresses you the most about Kamaru? <laughs> Guy's a beast. He's an animal. <laughs> um, I've gotten to know him a little bit too uh, via text messages. You know, I've always been a big fan of him. And, and you know, he comes in, I, you know, and obviously he is, he's decorated. He comes from that world of amateur wrestling. And, you know, these guys are beasts, national champion, amateur, uh, all American, by the way. So, um, you know, I think he, he comes in always great shape. He looks the part. He looks like a champion. Uh, so I always got nothing but great things to say about him. And, um, you know, his last couple of fights, especially his last fight, um, you know, where he, he was so precise and dominant where he needed to be, cool and calm in the pocket. So I can't wait. And, and you know, it's, it's no reason why he's undefeated. Yeah, I mean, there's no small task in front of him in Jorge Masvidal, although Masvidal is the underdog in this one. The last time I checked the odds, I think he was like a plus 235 underdog. I mean, looking at the matchup itself and knowing, and knowing Jorge so well, I mean, what do you feel like he needs to do to get this one done? Well, um, considering I have had uh, zero fights in the octagon, um, here's what... <laughs> here's what... Jorge Masvidal has to do. Now, I think that while I haven't been in the octagon, I've been in some pretty big professional wrestling matches with a lot of, with a, with a big global eye on me. So I think what Masvidal has to do is quiet the noise around him. Because the moment, one of the things is quiet the noise around him because the moment he took this fight, I just you get thrust back into this spotlight and you get pulled in a thousand different directions and everyone turns to you and they, their, their energy turns to you for answers and they need answers and you have to decide and decide and decide and decide. Then you have to train and then you have to prepare. And he's probably, and you're just thinking 24 seven. I mean, you, all of a sudden your energy and everything goes 
just like this. I mean, and so I think he just has to quiet the noise, get over there. It's very hot over there also too. And as you know, these guys have to, you know, you have to quarantine for a couple of days and then they got to cut, they got to try and make weight, you know, within a few hours and then they're fighting. So I think that he's got to quiet the noise and just remember Jorge Masvidal needs to do exactly what he was born to do, which is fight his ass off. And if he does these things, everything else is going to fall into place. I think that's beautiful advice, despite your zero octagon appearances. I think that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, I know that you're a fan. We see you at fights. We know that you watch fights at home. We see you tweeting about it. For you, what has it been like to be able to turn on the TV on a Saturday night or even a Wednesday night when we have these midweek cards and see these fighters get into the octagon and the UFC pull off these, these cards and these events and, and not just do it, but do it really well on a, on a huge scale in the midst of a global pandemic? The UFC is doing it right. And again, I'll, do, I'll go back to an anchoring motto of the show must go on. So when you have that spirit, you ingrain that spirit into your DNA from uh, an executive level with the company to the fighters, to the fighters camps, then the switch goes off. You have your myopic focus and you're ready to go. The show must go on. So my hat goes off to these fighters. They are risking, you talk about you know, Usman putting it all on the line, and he's got a lot to risk with this fight, but all the fighters have so much to risk, too, as well, when, yes, the, the risk is very high in MMA, uh, you know, there's, it's obviously very extreme, and you always wish for our fighters to be healthy and safe coming out of the fight, um, but also, there's just another layer of health that you have to deal with here that's very real, and um, in, a very, in a real global crisis that, that at times feels feels like times parts of the world are grieving. That's a heavy thing, I think, just psychologically to put on a fighter. And for these fighters to go over there, um, go to Fight Island, fight tonight, continue to fight every week, um, you know, putting on fights multiple times a week as the company is, my hat goes off to them. And I have so much love and respect for all of these fighters. I truly, truly do. And I'm so grateful that I, as just a big, bald, tattooed, fan can sit and enjoy. I mean, the fact that you're a fan of them, I, there's not a person on our roster or involved with our organization that would not say they're a fan of yours as well. So, you know, before I let you go, I would just love to hear your thoughts on, on just the pivot on what it takes for an organization like the UFC and a roster of over 600 athletes to just look in the face of a global pandemic and where all other sports are not, you know, being able to function at this moment and say, where can we, you know, turn left and make things go differently for us? I think that Dana and the UFC as a company have just done such a tremendous job at, um, at hello, look at this one. <laughs> we got a visitor, hey. Can you say hi to Megan? Hey, great to see you. <laughs> um, all right, well, okay, let Daddy answer this question. Okay. Okay, you're not gonna watch a video yet. Hold on one second. Okay. You wanna watch a video of daddy being amazing? That's what you want, right? Do you think daddy should fight in the UFC? No, neither should he. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, it's so commendable what the company UFC and Dana have done. They had to pivot through this, but also, you know, there's been so many organizations and groups in sports and outside of sports. And I know just dealing just in the middle of Hollywood and, and trying, to, um, trying to galvanize a big production and get it back up and running, there are so many moving parts to this thing. And for the UFC, not only to do it, but do it right and find success at doing it and creating a culture that feels about as safe as you can make it. And uh, I was, my eyes were wide open when I knew that Dana was uh, in the company. They were going to be one of the first ones out of the gates, if not the very first ones out of the gates in the world of sports to get back up and running and how are we going to do it? And of course, I mean, this is a sport, as you know, that, you know, the fighters, you got to get in there and you're sweating and you're bleeding. And it's just, it, it again, it, it's so, um, it goes against every fiber of us trying to be healthy, but the company has done it and they've done it in such a great way. They mitigated a lot of the concerns and um, 
And what they've also had to do is, I think, create a space for the fighters to evolve to as well. And what I mean by that, the space that I've noticed from my vantage point that fighters have had to evolve is this space of marketing and promoting their fights and how uniquely different it is this time around when you don't have the big press conference where there's a thousand press members and fans and the energy isn't, isn't uh, what once what it was. It's on the quieter side, obviously, you've been part of those, Megan. Um, the weigh-ins are differently. The fights are differently. So, you know, we as just... Uh, as me as a pro wrestler, someone who'd love to be in the middle of the ring and uh, having these matches, same thing with fighters, the intangible energy that you get is from the fans. And when you remove that, that is that completely changes the game. So I think for fighters to go in and not only that, but have to remain focused, go in there, fight their fights, but then also I'll go back to marketing and promoting, for fighters to go out and find unique ways now to promote a fight. And I, I think Masvidal, by the way, I think he's a great promoter. There's some fighters and I've talked to them in the past, given them a little bit of counsel on um, my vantage point, uh, because I always feel, and you'll see this as, a, as a, again, as a fan and somebody who at one time was in the world of wrestling, uh, where pay-per-view buy rates were our model, just like the UFC. Now it's a little different than WWE, their uh, subscription base. So the pay-per-view model isn't there, but I used to look at it like if I if I do not sell this pay per view, I don't. So I would do everything I can to put my opponent over, and I can appreciate that now. When you see there's little nuances that a few fighters are doing, where they realize that I'm just not going to completely crap on this guy who I'm fighting and say, "Oh, this guy's a nobody. He's a bum." Because the truth is, then if you feel he's nobody and he's a bum, it really doesn't motivate me to spend fifty plus bucks on this pay per view. Um, uh, and if you care about who you're fighting, then I care about who you're fighting. Not only that, but then when you really put over one of your, your opponent, you don't have to say he's the greatest of all time, but you find smart ways to put him over. Then if you beat him, well, you beat somebody. So I've noticed that with fighters too, and I've noticed how they've had a pivot during this pandemic too, and just little nuances in how they're promoting fights as well. So uh, again, I could check off all these boxes with you, Megan, and in such a positive way. I think the UFC is doing it right, Dana. And the most important thing is just the fighters. And you can feel their comfort now. There's not, a, not as many questions going through their heads. Is, is it gonna be safe, is it not? And then here we are, Fight Island 251. Cannot wait. Uh, if I were there, I'd jump in the, in the cage too as well. Listen, there's not time maybe for you to make this show, but maybe one later. You could fly on over here. We'll. We'll have you come you know, out. I mean, look, considering my massive cheat meals, uh, <laughs> me making weight is, what's that word? Uh, impossible. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing your opinions and your views with us, on, especially on this UFC 251 card. It's, it's always an honor to speak with you and to have you at our event. So we will be thrilled to know that you are watching. <laughs> I cannot wait. Thank you for being the best. Always good talking to you, too. And um, I can't wait. Let's enjoy the show.